Thank you all again for taking time out of your evening to join me. We're going to talk about gamification for e-learning. I once again probably have too much content crammed into too short a time frame, but let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so a lot of the content I'm going to cover in the next hour comes from Carl Kopp. Uh, he wrote this book, The Gamification of Learning and Instruction. He is a mainstay at basically any e-learning development conference where he talks about uh, gamification. We do have this book available at the Pollock Library. I don't recommend reading it for fun. It's pretty dense. Um, it is a really good desktop reference though, if you wanna keep it on hand to get some inspiration, uh, to look up the you know, research that backs up the power of gamification, things like that. So highly recommend giving that a look, but pleasure reading for the beach, it is not. Okay. So let's start by getting a little interactive. Uh, would you please pop into the chat or unmute yourself and share, what do you think makes something a game? What are the elements do you think go into making something a game? Again, you're welcome to unmute or just jump into the chat. A reward or points? Reward or points, yeah, definitely. Get some items in the the chat here. Yep, you can win or lose. It's interactive a lot of the time. Oh, competitive. Usually there's some sort of competitive element. Um, usually with uh, other people. Oop. Sorry, bumped computer. Score system. Uh, consequences for behavior. I like that. Consequences are really important. They are fun. Yes, games, games should be fun or at least enjoyable in some way. Sometimes you get frustrated by them, but you're motivated to continue on. Uh, there might be quest or purpose. You do some problem solving. There's progression. Yes, there's a progression uh, throughout the game. You don't just do the same level over and over. Each uh, level might get harder. Uh, it might be constraints, like uh, maybe limited time. Good, these are all um, really good points. Okay, so. Yeah, I agree. Um, this should get progressively more difficult. There's going to be some sort of feedback in the way of, um, you know, dying or having to redo a level, but that's also part of the feedback. So there's tasks you have to complete. You get feedback of some sort, some sort of consequences, and theoretically it should be constructed in a way that's going to be motivating to you to continue on. All right. So there's three main elements uh, that make a game a game three at the, at the core of a game. Uh, there's an objective, which is basically the win condition. You have to know what it is to win, what the goal is of a game. There's always gonna be constraints, particularly environmental. For instance, um, you know, chess is played on an eight by eight board. Uh, soccer is played on a certain size field with the goals laid out a certain way and the other elements of the field laid out a certain way. And of course there are rules and the rules usually only are adhered to because we all agree that they are rules. This is one of the kind of like social niceties, right? Like red lights only mean stop because we all agree that they mean stop and thank goodness we all agree on that. And in games, we agree the rules are rules. Um, people that cheat are usually not looked favorably upon. And that's from um, John Ferrer who wrote a book called Playful Design. He had a nice uh, podcast episode with Connie Malaman on the e-learning coach. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite definitions of a game, I heard this quote, I don't know, forever ago. It's a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. I always think of something like, again, soccer, where your goal is to get your ball into the goal behind your opponents, right? And you could just like pick up the ball and just like put it in there. But no, you can only use your feet. You can only, I don't know, stay on this side of the field. You can't go offside to pass it to your teammates. There's all these rules that make it much more difficult than it needs to be. And that's what makes a game fun. I mean, there's all sorts of obstacles in life. Let's choose some, some unnecessary ones to make it a game. And there's lots of elements, of course, uh, besides these, these three kind of main uh, qualifications to make something a game. There might be limited time. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, but that gives a sense of urgency to a game. There should be rewards. Uh, I'd say humans are intrinsically primed to seek out rewards. If there are no rewards, we're probably not gonna continue as much as we would otherwise. There should be some sort of feedback or consequences. Levels, it should get uh, 
progressively more difficult. There should be some sort of progression throughout the game because as you are performing the in-game tasks, you're going to get better and better at them because you, you're you're working on this, right? And if it remained the same, you're not going to continue playing that game. Often there's an element of storytelling, some sort of world building for the more complicated games. Uh, there's going to be some sort of game aesthetics. Uh, opportunities to replay or do over if you mess up on a level. There might be leaderboards. There can be a lot more besides this as well. It's just, just a sampling. Carl Cup's book has um, a bunch in there for you to for you to check out if you want to know even more elements of a game. Okay, so why would you want to make your e-learning into a game or use games in your e-learning? Generally games can be a very good thing to use because they are motivating for your learners. And this really depends on your learners. If you have learners that are not into games, like for some reason I imagine you have some advanced engineers and they need to complete some sort of like advanced training on some really esoteric subset of engineering knowledge, they're probably not gonna be pleased if it's made into some, some sort of a game. They probably want it straightforward, just the facts, master the content, bring it back to work and move on. Whereas if you've got maybe um, college students, you're trying to get involved in like social life at the university, maybe you would wanna use games. Maybe that'd be really appropriate, but Regardless, it's really important to know who your learners are, if they're gonna appreciate the, the fun that comes from a game, or if they're gonna be completely turned off by it. Because if your learners are not into it, it will be very demotivating for them. It's gonna have the opposite effect of what you're going for. Uh, additionally, games can be really beneficial to learning because they offer distributed practice, uh, which means that you might be performing the same task many times in a game and the more you practice something the better you get at it there's something called spaced practice in uh the science of learning where if you perform a same task like over time you know whether it's like seconds minutes or days or months apart it's going to help further cement it in your mind you're going to be better at it versus if you only do it once or twice in a single sitting so games can offer that of course, scaffolded content or increased difficulty of levels in game, you have progression. This fits in really neatly with the concept that you can scaffold content, particularly if you have beginners to a topic, you might introduce them to the topic by having them do some reading. You might have some sort of practice activity for them. You might make a more difficult practice activity, offer some more content and maybe have some build up to a final quiz that's really difficult. It's a simplistic um, example, but it does really help if you are able to scaffold content and then kind of slowly take away those scaffolds until the learner masters whatever it is at the end of an e-learning. Uh, and also flow. I remember there was someone that did their final project on flow and I can't remember who it was or maybe it was a paper in a class. Was it Lindsay? Um, no, not Lindsay, I'm sorry. I think it was 50. Oh, the one that got married, Kepler? I remember. I don't know the name. I forget. I forget her first name. But anyway, I'll remember. I don't remember. Pop in if you do, because I kind of wanted to, to email her or reread her paper because it was good. Um, so so flow, if you're not familiar with flow, that's the state you get in when you're doing something that's really enjoyable and you don't notice the passage of time. So that might be you're playing a game. That might be you are reading a book. It might be you're just on a walk and you're just really into the walk and you don't notice how much time has passed. Um, Flow is a really wonderful state where you're doing something you enjoy, time passes by, and you've been really productive with your time. And anyways, I should have rewrote that paper and have much more to say about flow. But this is something that a lot of the time if you're doing uh, e-learning or games for a workplace, it's a positive state to help your uh, target audience get into to complete an e-learning. Like if, you're, if your learners are completing your e-learning and they don't notice a passage of time, you're doing something really, really well. And that's going to be a much more effective learning experience than if, you know, you're doing some sort of like recorded webinar, maybe even this webinar where you're watching your, your clock going, oh, is this done yet? <laughs> so flow, flow is a very good thing when it comes to learning. It's a state I think we all often seek to achieve if we don't know what the name is. Okay, so back to, to Carl Kopp. He likes to use the phrase serious games. So we have games that are just for fun, uh, like again, soccer, baseball, um, 
I, I would say chess. Chess is a fairly serious game, but COP uses the phrase serious game to really refer to games for learning and maybe for games to effect some kind of social change. There's actually a um, website called Games for Change. I'll pull up really quick here. Uh, and the link here is in my PowerPoint. I'll share that at the end. This is a, a, just a collection of games that are educational in some sort of deep way or encourage role playing that helps you understand what it's like to be someone else, maybe someone disadvantaged or someone struggling and you want to understand their struggle better. Um, understand deeper social issues, understand history better, things that you're going to hopefully, you know, enter some sort of flow and get really deep into. It's a nice place to choose games for um, education as well. Uh, you probably are familiar. Oh, thank you, Maria. I see you're uh, coming in here. Because Kelsey, I'll have to look that up. Um, you are probably all familiar with serious games from some point in your education. They've been around since, I mean, 70s or before. They don't have to be computer games to be a serious game. But of course, my favorite example from my own childhood is uh, the Oregon Trail. We'd go to the computer lab <laughs> as a class and we would get through the math assignment or the reading assignment really fast so we could all see how we would meet our unfortunate end on the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail, of course, um, exists today. This is the, the DOS version that we played on in our um, often monochrome computers. Uh, I also spent a lot, a lot of hours and entered many flow states playing uh, where in the world or where the United States is, Carmen San Diego, which again has become a very large franchise where you are a detective trying to figure out who stole something but along the way, you are unraveling clues that you have to figure out uh, what destination they pertain to. And so you learn about geography and you learn about um, uh, cultural aspects as well by trying to chase the, the thief across the world following their clues. And of course, those are, those are old DOS games that are, are near and dear to my heart. Um, and there's newer games like this one's called Court Quest. This is from a platform called iCivics. You can, um, if I remember this, you can see the little iCivics.org. Uh, this is a collection of games that help you learn about civics in a way that is not dry. For instance, in Court Quest, Court Quest, say that three times fast, uh, you are a bus driver picking up passengers. Each passenger tells you whatever their legal trouble is in a, in a story, right? In a way that like kind of, humanizes them and seems realistic. And then you take them to the court that they need to resolve that legal trouble. So if someone has like a misdemeanor, you have to take them to the, I don't know, county court. I'm probably saying this wrong because I didn't play the game enough. Um, if they have like a felony, they have to go to the federal court. There's different kinds of courts and you have to figure out where each person needs to go. But to help you, you do have a sidekick in the game that's also a passenger on the bus to help you detangle these things. And it's a lot more fun than just reading about what kind of cases go to a federal court? What kind of cases go to a state court? So on and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity to use games to affect really deep and important learning, but still have fun doing it. And again, the more you play a game like this, the more distributed practice you get, the more that information is going to be cemented in your mind and you're going to do very well in a, in a testing class, for example. Okay, so let's pause for a second. Are there any other serious games that you know that are maybe near and dear to your heart? Or maybe not. Maybe they're total failures for you when you were um, playing them. Emery just loves games. <laughs> All games are serious games. The captions on this PowerPoint are hit or miss. Alex, I, I feel you. I like games, but I've never gotten so attached to a game that I've really finished. It. I think the only game I've ever finished was one, one of the Silent Hill franchises. That was pretty much it. Um, Brenton, no, serious games is a phrase used by, coined by Carl Kopp, uh, just to refer to games that are for learning or games that like affect some sort of like deeper social change. So like things that like, they're serious games, they're still games, but they're serious in some way that's going to affect some positive change in you for the better. 
Lauren, I was never able to beat a game as a kid. My sister, we had a we had a Sega, and my sister would play Lion King for hours and hours and hours, and she finally beat the game, and I just, I got too frustrated by by dying every time. Yeah, it's written, word munchers, number munchers. Yeah, there's a lot of really simple games for um, grade school, especially, that can help with, um, you know, making repetitive drill type uh, learning much more fun. Addie Jr., I think I probably played one. Yeah, Carmen San Diego, yeah. Jumpstart CD games, yeah. We used to have the CD ROMs. You'd put like the CD ROM into like the thing, into like had this like plastic case. You had to put the whole plastic case into the computer. That was like the first CD ROM my my school ever got. I think when I was a kid. Learn typing through Timon and Pumbaa. Oh yeah, we had something called Mavis Beacon teaches typing, which I also found very frustrating because it'd make a, a bad sound if you hit a key wrong. Duolingo, yes. Is Duolingo? Yeah, Marie. I'm bringing back memories for you, Marie. Huh. Oh, when you answer right, yeah, a lot of racing games. If you answer right, your um, your little character can go faster across the screen. <laughs> Mary, you loved Mavis speaking. I I learned to type very well from being an English major. I think I don't know if I could have gotten there with Mavis speaking alone. I was too frustrated when I got things wrong. Okay, let us scoot right along. Oh, Suzanne again, anti-racist board game. That sounds fun. Oh, zombie running app. I've been meaning to actually try that zombie app. Typing of the Dead. <laughs> these are all great. I want to check out all of these games. They sound like a lot of fun. Okie dokie. So let's talk um, about games and e-learning and focus a little bit more on the practicalities of actually developing games yourself. Because this is a more of a storyline focused webinar. I've been doing a storyline focused webinar. So let's um, uh, talk a little bit about that. Okay. So games and ID land, ID being instructional design land. This is a a word that I, I coined. But basically what I've noticed in my experience in instructional design is that there's not really in the field a unified de definition of games and or gamification. And most of the time when you see e-learning games, uh, they're just like regular e-learning modules with cosmetic gaming elements. Like, you know, you finish this section of the tutorial, here's a badge. Oh, you finish that, here's a hundred points. You answer that correctly. You know, here's a gold star, you can collect your gold stars. Um, it's really easy to just kind of like, you know, put lipstick on the pig, add in some cosmetic elements to a game. And of course, that's not, that's not a real game. It's not necessarily a bad thing if it's just cosmetic and maybe you're not hurting the learning experience. Maybe there's, Maybe it's got enough personality that it is helping um, increase motivation a little bit, but they're not true games. Uh, at DevLearn this year, which was recorded, <laughs> which was great because I'm still working through a lot of the presentations, there was a, a, a man, uh, Dr. Jonathan Peters, that gave, gave four levels of gamification, which I thought was, um, was I thought really rang true for me. Um, he says that the first level is just cosmetic. So maybe you just add the aesthetics of a game, you add maybe some points or um, other really simple design elements to kind of liven up in e-learning. So it's, you know, maybe maybe more fun and funky than it would have been otherwise, but it's not, it's not a game. The next one he calls um, accessory, the level is accessory. So you might do points, badges, and leaderboards. You know, I've made, you know, games, <laughs> simple games like these, where maybe it's just a multiple choice quiz, but the more answers you answer correctly, the more questions you answer correctly, the more points you get, and maybe there's a leaderboard, and maybe, maybe it helps the learners feel good about their score, or maybe they're just like, it's just a quiz, guys, why is there a leaderboard? So a little bit more involved than a, a cosmetic. There's some sort of like functional aspect, but it's still not really a game. Um, so integrated is where he says that um, gamification is actually core to the learning experience. It's not just dressed up. There's not just, you know, a functional aspect. Um, there's actually more of a new environment where learners are really experiencing this as a game. Uh, it's not just another tedious e-learning module. Uh, the game mechanics are really integrated into the learning process. So it's not like you're just answering a multiple choice quiz, you're doing a simulation of some sort of on the job task you might be doing at your normal job. You're doing something else that should be aligned to the real world, but it really is a, a true, more of a true game. Ooh, and the final one there, of course, is the, forgive my French, raison de tray. <laughs> the entire program is actually just a game. And 
this may or may not be a game uh, for learning, but as you, any of you that have played games probably know, when you play a game, you end up learning, right? You learn how to play the game, you get better at the tasks in the game. Um, learning might actually just be a byproduct of the game itself. So learners know they're playing a game and learning is almost like besides the point at this, this, this point. So again, um, in ID land, there's different explanations of gamification, what makes a game, what doesn't make a game, dressing things up, not dressing things up, whether or not, you know, this is real effective or, or worth developing and spending your time on. Um, you know, it, it may or may not be appropriate for any given uh, context or again, target audience. So you wanna know uh, your learners and um, what they might, might enjoy and find useful. Okay. So of course, there are major development constraints. Any of you that are, you know, serious gamers, not like serious games, but like you're like serious gamers, you're on Twitch watching other people play your favorite games or something. Um, you know, the games are really, really complex. People uh, develop games for a living. It takes massive teams of people to develop a very complicated game and um, serious expertise in a specialized software to make games. Uh, so there's there's lots of constraints if you wanna do an e-learning game. Software is probably gonna be one of your, your top constraints. If you're just using Storyline or Captivate, you're gonna have some major constraints for what you can actually do because with, soft, with software like Storyline and Captivate, you're basically just creating a fancy website. It's not really gonna be like a fully immersive experience like you would get with, um, I wanna say off the shelf game or you know, like a Steam game or something else. Additionally, games are really complex, of course. So designing them takes a lot more time. Developing takes them a lot more time. Uh, you have to do a lot more debugging. That's gonna take a lot of time. Uh, graphic design, I think would actually be a major component that would be a huge constraint as well, because if you want the game aesthetics to look professional or you know, at least not distracting from the game, that takes a lot of work. And again, probably a lot of people and I didn't even include the word budget in this list. There's lots, lots of more constraints I'm sure that you can think of as well. If you have some more, feel free to pop them into the chat box. But there's, there's a lot that goes into a game and it can be very challenging to um, build out yourself. So if you wanna take a quick look at Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, if you're not familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, this is basically cognitive learning divided into to six easy to recall levels. The, the bottom level is remember. So basically with any topic that you're new to, the first thing you're gonna do cognitively is recall things like basic, basic concepts and facts, right? So imagine if you are a junior in high school taking a history class and you're starting a new unit, say on the Civil War, you're gonna start out by learning, you know, what the dates of the Civil War were, maybe who was involved in the Civil War, where the Civil War took place, you know, really basic large concepts that you need to remember so that you can begin to understand the stuff that comes after that, okay? And then basically these all kind of feed up towards the top. So you start kind of down here with any given topic and you're going to work your way up until finally you mastered everything so well about this topic that you are able to produce new or original work. Now, when it comes to storyline or captivate, you're only going to be able to go so far in an asynchronous e-learning. Uh, I mean, all of you are enrolled in um, MSIDT, you're taking a facilitated class. You can do a lot higher level learning in the facilitated class because you have a real person that you're interacting with that's creating a work, that's creating assignments, that's like tailoring the, the learning experience. But if you have an asynchronous learning experience that you've built out in Storyline, there's really only so much you can do because everything in that experience is automated, right? It's kind of like, you know, multiple choice quiz versus an essay quiz. A computer isn't able to grade an essay. A computer can grade a multiple choice quiz, but there's only, only so much you can measure with a multiple choice quiz. So in my experience, this is pretty much as far as you're going to go um, with Bloom's Taxonomy if you're building out games using Storyline or Captivate. Again, if you're using more specialized software like a Unreal or Unity, which they use to build like games, like big G games, you're going to be able to do a lot more. But of course, you're also going to be spending like hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, millions of dollars developing a game. Okay. So all of that said, there's still lots of ways to create games in Storyline and to create games that aren't in Storyline. So for instance, um, Carl Kopp did a nice little presentation at DevLearn. He had the term frame games. I only saw him use it, this term in this presentation. It wasn't in his book. 
But basically, a frame game is just kind of what it sounds like. It's just a frame of a familiar game that you put your own content into. And you are you are probably very familiar with these. So the first example he gave, he called Earthquake. This is a game he plays over Zoom with his students because he's a professor. I can't remember what, what school he's a professor at. But he has his students team up and they choose kind of like battleship like 1a 1b if they get a question and they answer a question correctly they get 100 points but they should know they might accidentally hit an earthquake all of these um x's on screen here these are all earthquakes where basically it's like you lose a turn right so this game is just a frame it's called earthquake but the the content is all about instructional design I'm sure at some point you have all played. Yes, Marie already beat me to it in the chat. Jeopardy! <laughs> easy to build out, and well, relatively easy to build out in storyline, just um, kind of tedious to build. Um, pretty much everybody has played either Jeopardy on, on, on TV, played along Jeopardy on TV, or had an educational version of Jeopardy that they, they played along with because it's just, it's just a frame. You can literally put any content you want into there. Um, another one I've built out is um, Tic-Tac-Toe. I'll demo this in a little bit, but each um, slide or each slide, each box here, when you click on it, you have to answer three questions correctly to get this uh, box for yourself. Otherwise, it goes, Mer, it gives you a, a, a O, and that's for the, um, the computer, the computer opponent. So if your X is, you have to answer correctly to get the X's. Otherwise, if you answer your one question wrong, it goes, Mer, and it goes to your opponent. So this is just a frame, like tic-tac-toe is just a way to deliver content and actually basically multiple choice um, distributed practice quiz uh, that's a little bit more palatable than just, you know, a regular old multiple choice distributed practice quiz. Okay, so back to serious games. Um, for a game to be a serious game and to be effective as an e-learning, whatever activity or skill the learner is doing in the game, needs to be the same or basically perfectly aligned to so something that you would do in the real world. A lot of the time people get enthusiastic. Oh, Lucy's got Jeopardy running in the background. That's funny. Um, a lot of people, you know, game designers or, or e-learning developers can get overly enthusiastic and say, all right, we're going to do the spy game and they're going to do all these things. But nothing they're going to learn in that game is necessarily going to transfer to what they need to do at work. I, instructional design tends to be very corporate and work for, workforce oriented. So that's something to consider with where, you know, your own uh, working context is. In general, you're using a game to teach someone something. So whatever that learning objective is that you have, that learning objective stays the same. You can do some corollaries that, you know, you're aligning the game to that learning objective. It's not actually what they're going to do exactly in real life but it still needs to be well aligned so that they learn something that's actually important and useful for them. Um, here's some examples of this. Uh, these are from Carl Kopp's book again. The company Cisco, for example, had something called the binary game. If you're not familiar with binary numbers, it's, it's ones and zeros and it's basically the, the bottom foundation of all coding ever, right? Ones and zeros are what makes the world run. And new employees that were unfamiliar with binary numbers, they would play this game that just taught them to recognize and understand binary games. Think back to um, Bloom's Taxonomy, remember and understand where the bottom two levels. This was a really good example of a serious game that taught something they're gonna use at their work and is gonna help them understand and do their work better. But it was a game where they just had to identify ones and zeros and how they worked. Uh, IBM had this game called Innovate. It doesn't sound super exciting, but it's kind of like a, maybe it's a, maybe it's fine. It's like sim business where there's a fictitious, fictitious company and the employee learner has to make decisions for this company and then experience the um, consequences of those decisions and see how they actually affect the business. Uh, one of my last webinars was on um, scenarios and scenarios are, are kind of similar. So this is like a really built out scenario, right? Where you are presented with a problem, you have to make a decision for that problem and then you experience the consequences of that. So that easily can be turned into a, a full on game that would have really useful uh, learning potential for whatever you're doing in real life. Yeah, Marie mentions um, learning the Dewey Decimal System for library shelving. Super tedious to learn, <laughs> but if you turn into a game of some sort, and I actually did have a student once that did a Dewey Decimal game, or um, tutorial at least, uh, it can be made a lot more engaging than just, you know, index cards and memorizing, for example. 
Okay, so talked a bit about constraints, talked a lot about elements. Let's talk about pitfalls. And I'm sure there's lots more pitfalls than what I present here. If you have more, please drop them into the chat box. So pitfalls could be, of course, limiting game elements to just cosmetic. You know, if there's just badges on screen or it's just a dressed up e-learning, that's not really a serious game. If, if it's not done well, it can just be seen as, you know, cheesy and inauthentic to your learner. And again, could be demotivating for your learner. Our, our goal here is to induce flow and to motivate our learners. So you don't want to do anything that might distract them from that. So just discussed, if, if your tasks being performed in game are not real, well aligned to what they're supposed to be doing in the real world following the game, that game is not a successful learning experience. So you always have to remember this is a learning experience. Uh, whatever they're doing in the game has to be real, well aligned to real world tasks. Coming back to, um, I know, say something like like Carmen San Diego or Carl Cop talks about spy games, for instance. It could be a just up a game like a spy game where you're doing some sort of problem solving that can still be really well aligned to a real world task because, say, at your job or in real life, you need to learn to practice problem solving at some given topic. And if you're doing similar problem solving, but you're dressing it up as like a spy and you have a persona and there's some other game elements in there as well, that's gonna be an effective learning experience if it's done well and done right. Feedback, of course, is really important. Uh, similar to the tasks not being well aligned to real world tasks being a pitfall. If there is unrealistic or non-existent feedback in a game, it's not gonna be a good learning experience. I like to talk about uh, the importance of feedback as being really critical to the learning process. If you are you know, trying to test out your knowledge and you have no way to figure out if you're right or wrong, you're not gonna be able to reinforce that knowledge and understand that you are right or wrong, right? Um, talk about this a lot in um, e-learning. Say again, you present your content, you have some sort of quiz and say that quiz doesn't actually, I mean, it just gives you a score at the end and you don't know if you answered each question correctly. Your knowledge and your skills are not gonna be reinforced by that and you're just left kind of uncertain of where you stand. So feedback is really important. So positive or negative, it's all gonna be corrective and help you reinforce whatever that knowledge or skill is. Another big issue is um, difficulty, I'm sure, uh, Again, people people do this for a living for a reason. A game can be too easy or it can be too hard. I don't have any very good advice on that at the moment, but something to consider as you're building out your games. Um, and a lot of the time, if you have um, do-overs built into your game, say, you know, you make the wrong choice, like a choose your own adventure book and, and you die and you're only 10 pages into the book, <laughs> that can be that can be potentially demotivating if you have maybe a big chunk that you have to start over. Any of you that are serious gamers, you know, if, you're, if your character dies in the game, you start the level over or you start the game over. And if you're like three hours in a game and you've had to go back to the very beginning, that's really frustrating and demotivating. So think about that if you have um, a do over, how demotivating that might be. There's actually, a, um, I, I didn't find it in time to demo it for this webinar, but there's a storyline game someone made that was like, a, you're drinking your way through Europe or something. But if you answered a quiz question wrong, the game was kind of structured by, by trivia questions you had to answer, it kicked you all the way back to the beginning, which was super frustrating to have to go all the way back and have to answer all of those questions again. So again, consider your audience, do a lot of testing, figure out where an appropriate place to, to respawn would be. All right, let's pause for a moment. Any other pitfalls? Feel free to unmute, use the chat box. Any other thoughts, please um, let me know. All right, in a moment, I'm just going to move along to um, storyline demos. Manny says, yeah, make sure, making sure things map flow, navigate correctly. I would say that the um, design in Addy would come in really important when building out a game, especially if you're using variables or triggers. It's really helpful to have all this mapped out on, on paper, as it were, in advance to save yourself time in the development and make sure everything is, is built out correctly. Brenton, yes, Pitfall is a great game. I actually had an Atari as a kid. <laughs> we played Pitfall on the Atari. It, it was really fun. Alex, yes, games would be really good for learning tedious info like anatomy. Yeah, you see a lot of it used for like spelling, math, stuff that you're not really excited about, but you got to learn. Maria had an Atari as well. What happened to that Atari? Yeah, Lucy, Too Hard is a big one. 
Too many steps in verification to obtain a digital or not real badge, for example. <laughs> Remembers the model of her Atari. I don't remember that. Apple II. Brent had an Apple II, apparently. I didn't have an Apple. That's so funny. I didn't think about that as I was saying pitfalls. That totally uh, corresponds to games. All right, let's scoot right along here. Okay, so generally my um, webinars are storyline oriented. Let's go into storyline. So this is a list of um, games I developed um, or modified myself. Um, I, I didn't, I built all but two of these from scratch. Obviously not the more storyline games down here. Um, let's give you a quick look at these. Maybe these will give you some inspiration as you um, are considering building these out yourself. Oh, let me start at the beginning here. Okay. So speaking of tedious things, uh, when I was a librarian, whoop, one of our jobs was- um, oh, Hey, 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 once yes. a librarian, always a librarian. <laughs> You know, I struggle with that. I say, I'm a librarian, but I'm currently a non-practicing librarian. It's like being like a lawyer that isn't employed as a lawyer or something. Yeah, I'm still a librarian at heart. So when I was employed and being paid as a librarian, uh, one of our jobs at, working at, a at Cal State Fullerton was to teach um, APA, which is super tedious. I mean, like raise your hand if you have APA. Um, Alex, these are all going to be linked on through this PowerPoint, I really need to update my website. Turns out I've actually got some flash-based storyline games that no longer work, which is a little bit embarrassing, um, but they'll all be in the, the PowerPoint for sure. Actually, if I can find the, let me see if I can find the chat really fast. In case any of you have to go early. Where is the chat? Oh, I know where it is. There it is. Let me put this into the chat. Oh, perfect, okay. I still had it in my clipboard. So into the chat, in case any of you gotta gotta run. Um, this is the link to the what will be the recording and what will be the PowerPoint. I don't think I've put it in there yet, but right after this presentation, I'm gonna put everything in there because I've been modifying this PowerPoint right up until um, this uh, session began. So everything. Oh, Marie checked. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> it's empty right now, but everything is gonna go into there, and you'll have links to all of these things in the PowerPoint. Oh, Suzanne, great. Yeah, you can play this APA game. Um, uh, the I built this on sixth edition, now it's seventh edition, but I don't think there's anything in these that I'm gonna show that needs to be changed. So they should be good to go. Okay, so reference list. Yeah, APA is really tedious. I've gotten really good at APA because I, I teach, I correct people's APA and I was um, teaching APA as a librarian and I used APA in my own degree programs. I think both of them. Um, so at one point I was feeling spunky and i created a, a few games and this is part of a, a larger uh scenario that i built where it's like i simulated you having to finish a, a reference list some of you that have been in, in my 540 class and i assigned you all <laughs> to do it um but i need to redo that that also for seventh edition it's a little bit dated now but i had um sub games within it and these are the sub games and the deal, uh, idea with these was that it was like the knowledge check or the distributed practice where it's like a game within a game. And you can, if you're not sure how you're going to, you know, do building this out or you need help to, before you build out your reference list, you could play this game to get a little bit better at it. So the rules are basically, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you click on a box and to win that box, you have to complete three multiple choice questions. And I wanted to align this to real life by offering an APA guide along with it. I actually built out a custom APA book for this um, tutorial, but it was it's out of date, so I replaced it with the APA Owl. Um, so you have this to refer to because in real life, when you're creating a reference list, you're not doing it from memory. You're doing it by looking at the APA guide. So my thought was that I'm, I'm lining this well to a real world task because in real life, you're referring to something to build out a reference list. And if you're completing a quiz on a reference list, you should also have the same opportunity to refer to something. All right, so you go through this, you answer the questions. If you get it correct, let me finish this really fast. Um, it's all pretty simple, put things into order. So I'm testing a few different aspects of um, the reference list. You submit it, if you get it, you got it, you get the X. And then when you go back, the box will autofill with an X. If you don't get it, say you answered it um, incorrectly here, 
then it goes to your you know computer opponent which is which is the l and if you get three in a row of course you win as you can imagine this is probably pretty complicated to build in the back end if we have time i'll um i'll show you and i'm also going to put the the raw files into that folder as well so if you want to check out the back end of these you're welcome to as well Carol, that was a hard game. Lindsay taught me APA for sure. Oh gosh. Um, okay, so that, that's tic-tac-toe. So this is a, again, this is like a frame game. It could be any sort of frame game. I'm just having you complete multiple choice questions related to APA reference list. And each box is a separate set of questions. So basically what I did was I built out nine question banks in Storyline. And each of these boxes pulls one of those up and it, it shuffles the questions. And I've got it, each little mini quiz set up to, um, you know, affect the, the desired change for the X or the O on this. Um, any questions about this? Um, I always have too much, too much to cover in my, my webinar. So I wanted to scoot right along. So again, frame game, something tedious, your reference list is made a little bit less tedious by completing a game, perhaps. Um, I did have this as an optional activity so people could self select into it if they wanted to try it out or not. Okay. This I did not build myself. I mean, I could, but a lot, again, building games is a lot of work. This is also an APA game where it deals with just the authors that you would list in any given reference list citation. Okay. This was built by Tim Slade. Uh, if you ever watched any webinars or presentations by Tim Slade, he's wonderful. If you haven't, he's wonderful. You should go check him out. He builds beautiful things and gives really great explanations of how to build really effective um, e-learning, like visually, like he does presentations on animations and how to use them, other aspects of visual design. He's um, pretty clever. But again, this is basically um, a timed trivia game. So you have the gaming elements here. It's not a, a super exciting game. I wouldn't call it a, a fully serious game. It's more of a frame game where you just answer a multiple choice question and submit. So you can see this is actually just a gussied up quiz in Storyline. Uh, these are uh, built out uh, master slides for each type of quiz question. Cause you see you answer it and you still have to click submit. And it tells you the correct feedback if you got it or if you didn't get it, uh, you didn't get it. Suzanne, yes, very much it resembles Kahoot. This is more just like an individual version, but you can assign Kahoots, which I've done for my classes as well. And Kahoot, much easier to build out and assign than uh, building something out in Storyline. But this was fun to build because it was um, something that, again, that I included as part of a larger game. So there's just, you know, 10 questions here. Um, I think it's important in a game to be able to track your progress. So I've got the question three out of 10 listed here on the tic-tac-toe. You can see the, the nine squares and you can see what you need to do or not do. Um, so I think that's important too. In, in any e-learning, I say it's important to kind of know where you are and how, how to, um, be able to manage your expectations of what's going to come. So I would also do that in games or in your games as well. I skipped it a little bit. Okay, this is a really weird one that I created. Um, I spent too much time one day building out a little space shooter game with little like spaceships and you had to like kill the spaceships as they came down. And I decided to repurpose this. Um, again, I was trying to align this to a real life task where you need to recognize if your volume issue and page are formatted correctly in your citations list. And this, this was always something that was kind of confusing for me until I realized that in an APA citation, the order is volume issue pages. And I'm like, oh, that stands for VIP. It's, I mean, the VIP has nothing to do with a the space theme, but hey, <laughs> cut me a break here. But the idea is you need to shoot down the ones that are formatted incorrectly. So I've got a, a good example up here. So the volume needs to be italicized and then the issue and pages should not be italicized. And you can um, shoot three incorrect ones as your lives and then you die. So this one, incorrect. So if you pop that, there's actually a volume that's not coming through. Um, and you have to recognize them as they come through. So again, this is supposed to be true to life in that you are recognizing formatting. So when you need to check your own reference list, this can give you some distributed practice in doing that. Let's see, let's, let's shoot one that's, that's actually correct. This one's correct. I'm going to shoot it. So you can see, oh, I already actually I already killed a, a couple of lives here. Yeah, let's go ahead and kill myself. And so the idea is that this gets progressively harder as you go through. There's more, they come faster. And this is it. This is basically like a one slide game. 
with just a ton of um, elements on it. And you can play again if you want to, or you can move on. Oh, you can see it's got a weird glitch where this is still moving. I don't know why. Oh, thanks, Beza. Yeah, um, this is a fun, silly game to build. And how I built this was actually, these are all just, um, these are all just shapes with um, the text inside and they're all formatted the same. And I had a, you know, a correct one and an incorrect one. And I just did a whole bunch of copying and pasting after I gave them all animations. So basically this is just, they're all animated. They're, they all have a um, enter from top animation that I set to go for like five or 10 seconds or something. So if you looked at this um, slide in the raw version, you would see that there's just a whole bunch of crap like above the slide and it's all just set to like come slowly down through the slide until it gets completely overwhelming. And I think there's actually a glitch where you can actually can't beat the game. So that's kind of fun. But again, the idea is take something tedious, make it a little bit less tedious, but still keep it true to um, a real world task. All right, Jeopardy, um, again, this is, I did not build this, it's very pretty. This was built by someone, um, John Harker, who shared the template on eLearning Heroes. It's wonderful when you can find really high quality examples of games, even better if you can find people that share your templates <laughs> with you. Uh, because I could build this out, but it would just, it would take a long time to build out and it takes a long time to make things pretty. So if you can reuse something that's even better. So you know how this works. You put in your topics, you put in your questions. It tells you if you're correct or incorrect. And this one, it's not the most elegant as far as usability goes, but it gets the job done. The box appears after you've answered it. Your score appears down here. You could reset it and go to the next level, so on and so forth. So Visa asks, how would a flowchart look for a gamified storyline project? So that's a hard question to answer because you'd have one flow chart that kind of maps out how the overall game works. I've talked about this with students one-on-one -on -one, um, when, for projects we've done in class, but you'd probably end up with additional sub flow charts. So you probably have like one big one that gives the overall big picture. But then if you had, um, you know, a complicated module or an in-game task, you'd probably want to flow chart that out. And if you have the same task a few times in a game, you might just flow chart it out once and then just, you know, create your content separately that could be plugged into that. I don't have a really really quick example for that. I don't have any examples of um, flow charts for games, but I would say again, probably multiple flow charts. It's, it's where it gets really complicated designing these things. Keep the questions coming if you have more questions. I'm running a little bit low on time here. Um, okay, so this one I built out for a live library event. And this was fun. So this one isn't um, fully, fully operational, but what I did was I found someone online wrote directions on how to use JavaScript and Google spreadsheets to make a live internet enabled leaderboard that connects to storyline. So that when you play the, the game or, you know, simple trivia game, your name would appear live here for anyone else that was also playing the game. I've got um, a link to those instructions um, through the, the PowerPoint as well. And so we were actually playing this live with people and having them just go through and um, answer again. These are just like, you know, not very exciting trivia questions that you go through. It gives you a score at the end. And then if you um, make it to the end, you put in your name and then it tells you where you rank in the leaderboard. This was, was fun to build out on the storyline end. And it was fun to try to get to work with um, Google because there's also some, some coding that you have to manipulate and enter onto the Google spreadsheets end as well. But that was really cool that no matter who was playing this game and where they were, that Google spreadsheet would keep the leaderboard information and feed it back into this leaderboard. So this leaderboard would update live depending on um, how people they're also playing the game did. All right, so those are my, my personal examples. Again, I've got, um, I'll provide raw files and links to the published versions for those in that, in that folder. I'll do that um, probably tomorrow. <laughs> I'll promise tomorrow. I might get some done tonight, but I'll do it tomorrow for sure. Check tomorrow. Um, and, those, those are my versions. You're welcome to poke around and um, maybe reuse if they're helpful to you. And I've got a link here too to um, 
more storyline games to check out and they really vary in quality a lot of these are created for e-learning heroes challenges so people were really pressed for time and kind of just came up with stuff really fast but um ones like this like like card games i think are really interesting and those could be fun to try to build out a lot of these people also have the 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 raw file available for you to take a look at and reuse as well. So take a look at those. It's really nice to see how people um, built things out. Okay. Let me move that over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. I'm pretty much on time here. I'll provide the raw versions of my files in that um, folder. If you have questions about how stuff works, let me know. We can discuss it further. Some of them are pretty complicated. And some of them I built like four or five years ago, and I don't really remember how I put it together. So it might take me a little bit of time to figure out what I did and get back to you. Okay. So I mentioned that Carl Kopp wasn't really an exciting book to read and certainly not inspirational. But I do recommend Jane McGonagall's book, Reality is Broken, as an inspirational read. I read her book, and that's when I was actually inspired to start building out games and storyline. I, I like to say that um, I became an advanced user of Storyline and Captivate by playing with the software. And what better way to play with the software than by building out games? You know, think of some simple game and try to recreate it in, in, in your software. Like, don't do chess. <laughs> maybe checkers. Maybe a dice game or dominoes or something. But I really recommend this book. It's one wonderful. She has, I don't know, just it's just a fantastic read. Where there's a lot of storytelling in there as well that can be um, really inspirational for you. So highly recommend. Okay, big takeaways. So adding superficial elements does not a game make. Just slapping badges on something doesn't make it a game. That doesn't mean it's wrong to slap badges on something, but don't call it a game if it's not really a game game. Gamification can be motivating, but you really have to know your target audience because if your learners are not motivated by a game, they can be demotivated by the game. And if someone's not motivated, they are not learning. As Carl Kopp uh, has the term serious games, games can create serious change, especially with um, storytelling, stepping into someone else's shoes, uh, problem solving, something you've never had to do in real life potentially. So learning, behavior, social, all these things can have serious changes because of games. And there is that, that um, website, Games for Change, I linked in the PowerPoint. You can check out to see more of that. Storyline is great for simple games. You're not going to be able to build out really incredible first-person shooters or anything like that. Um, you'll use the software Unreal or Unity for those. And there actually are free uh, versions of those that you can get if you want to try that out. That's a whole other discipline. We're talking about e-learning. We can make simple e-learning games totally achievable with Storyline. Start simple, build your way up, and um, be mindful of your constraints, your time, your resources, um, what the software is capable of, visual design, all those things. And my biggest takeaway for you is just to play with your software. You know, get inspired, check out my examples, see the examples on the Storyline website, see what other people have done. Play with your software yourself. Take some time aside to do it. You'll probably find yourself entering a flow state and learning a lot. Okay, that is it from me. I am finishing on time. I am going to stop the recording. <laughs>